Hello, thank you for having me here. Um, when I was a kid, I was known as Robin Sawyer, Robin. Uh, my mother wanted me to be called that, and my dad said, well, you know, you can call him Robin if you want, but make his legal name a boy's name, right? So make it Robert on the birth certificate. So it was, but I didn't discover that fact until I was 10. In fact, my grandmother outed it when I was 10. She said, you know, your real name is Robert. I go, ah, stop shitting me. No, it was. So, okay, I, my name turned out to be Robert, and I thought, so all these years I've been enduring invitations to join girls' skating teams and girls' volleyball teams from the North York Parks and Recreation Department because they thought I was a girl because I had the first name Robin. So I thought, never again. So when I was 10, I switched over to being Robert Sawyer. Then when I set out to become a science fiction professional, I thought, Robert Sawyer isn't going to cut it, because everybody knew that if you're going to be a great science fiction writer, like Arthur C. Clarke, or Robert A. Heinlein, or a great uh, science fiction hero like James T. Kirk, you had to have a middle initial. So I, adopt, I, I use my middle name, James, and I'm Robert J. Sawyer. Now, that's turned to serve me well, because when you search on Google for Robert J. Sawyer, all the hits are about me. Whereas if you search for Robert Sawyer, there are lots of other Robert Sawyers. Uh, and you could spend the next several years going through all 350,000 hits about Robert J. Sawyer. I've made a good dent in it so far. It's not all pretty, but you can have a look for yourself. The reason I mention all of that is because to be an important person in science fiction, you have to have that middle initial. And one of the examples I gave was Robert A. Heinlein. And I want to structure my talk around Robert A. Heinlein's advice, because even if you aren't a science fiction reader or writer, Heinlein set a template for how one can be a professional in any field of writing. And the beauty of Heinlein, there were two interesting things about Heinlein. The first was people would ask him, what's the secret of your success? And then he would tell them, and people would say, I'm surprised that you're willing to share because what you're doing is empowering me to become your competition. And he said, none of you are gonna follow my advice. I give this advice all the time and nobody ever follows it. So I come off looking good and it doesn't hurt me in the least to tell you the secrets of success. And I think that's actually true. I'm gonna demonstrate it as we talk here. The other thing though that Heinlein said, and he was being more sincere when he said this, because for those who did follow his advice, they said at the end to him afterwards, they said, thank you, but how can I possibly repay you? And he said, quite rightly, you can't. There's not a single thing you, as a beginner, can do for me, the established old fart. There's nothing you can do for me. But you can not pay me back, but you can pay forward. When you're somewhere along the road toward where I am, turn around and help the next guy in line. And that's the holy tradition of being a writer. It is, you can, of course, go and study writing at university or college. You can and certainly be mentored uh, in a formal context, but traditionally forever it has been uh, a field in which we have relied not just on the kindness of our associates, but the kindness of strangers as well. And all I ask, if you get anything out of my, those who are at my workshop this morning, or you have a blue pencil with me this afternoon, or the talk I'm about to give now, or get anything from any of my colleagues who are speaking here this weekend, the way you pay us back is when you're in a similar place somewhere down the road, you turn around and pay back somewhere, somebody else. You pay forward. That was Heinlein's greatest legacy. He's best known in science fiction writing circles for Heinlein's rules, and there are five of them. And I'm gonna take you through those five rules and why they are so important. Now, um, I was told when I arrived here that there are about 100 people who have registered for the conference. You take everybody in account who's working on it, 140. There are 100 registrants for this conference, more or less. It's an interesting figure, and pay attention to that 100 as we go through this. Because Heinlein's first rule, rule number one, is you must write. And the astonishing thing is that so many people asked him, how do I become a writer, and they had never written anything. The single biggest reality is that people like to have written, but very few people like to actually write. And you cannot become a writer without actually writing. Now this is a wonderful conference and there are wonderful courses and wonderful workshops you can belong to. There are all kinds of things that you can do to further your goal of becoming a writer. But the only one that will actually 
change your state, as we would say in physics, from liquid to gaseous, uh, will actually change you from wanting to be a writer to being a writer, is actually sitting down and doing writing. If at the end of this weekend, end of today, you go home and tell your loved ones that you had a great time and you were inspired and you had fun and you met interesting people and you ate a good meal, uh, all of that is nice. But if tomorrow you don't go to your keyboards, this event has been a failure. You have to actually write. Now, we writers hear all the time from people who want to write. For many years, it's funny, you don't have great conversations with your dentist. Have you ever noticed that? Dentist is a job for a guy who likes to pontificate. He's got his hands in your mouth and he's got tubes and instruments in there and there's something well, You can't talk, he talks to you. So it was really actually no surprise that after many years, my dentist did not know what I did for a living. And he finally asked me, there was one time where he was doing something where I could talk, and he said, so what do you do for a living? And he said, I'm a science fiction writer. I said, really? I said, yes, I've published X number of novels and so on and so forth. And he said, wow, you know, I always thought that when I retired, I would become a writer. Now, Wayne and Wayson and Kathy, everybody over there, we live for these moments because this is the classic line, right? We're, we're waiting for the setup, and we've got the punchline to knock it out of the park, and there he is, he says, wow, when I retire, I thought, you know, I've always thought I'd become a writer. To which I said, well, you know, when I retire, I always thought I'd like to become a dentist. <laughs> My dentist did not miss a beat. His reply was, I can introduce you to the right people. The last intelligent conversation I ever had with my dentist, we went back to him just putting things in my mouth. The point of all this is that you actually do have to do this thing called writing, and it is a sacrifice to do it. When people say to me, the subtext of that, oh, I always thought I would retire and do this, is that everything else in my life up until the point at which I'm done with my career and probably done with raising my children, done with everything else, then I might get around to being a writer. Those of us who have written and are published and are successful are those things because we made sacrifices in our day-to-day -day lives to get to where we are. That is the part that keeps people from taking Heinlein's first rule, which is you have to write. To have to write means you're not going to be at a social event, and you're not going to be out at a movie with your friends, and you're not going to be playing with your kids, and you're not going to be watching Flash Forward, your favorite TV series, Thursday nights at 8 on CTV. <laughs> you're going to be actually alone in a room, pounding away at a keyboard in an act of pure creativity, without any feedback, without any support, and sacrificing from your life to do that. And if you don't make those sacrifices, you won't ever have written. Of the hundred people in this room who have come here and said, self-selected, I want to be writers, who would shell out the money otherwise, right? There are other things to do with your money. Of the hundred of you who have said that, on average, only about half of you will actually write. You'll read Reader, Writer's Digest, you'll go to seminars, you'll belong to book clubs, you'll talk about your dream, you'll tell everybody that you're going to do it one of these days, you're going to do the great Canadian novel. Only half of you are going to put the seat of your pants in the seat of the chair and pound away at the keyboards in that act of sacrifice, taking time out of your life to do this sacred thing that's called writing. Writing.